Sitaram Jason. Yes. And it's indeed a privilege and a pleasure to be here again this Thursday morning as we have been over the last few years. And um, the weather is out beautiful. And I want to remind our brothers and sisters listening both locally and those within uh, reach of the telephone, they, this is an interactive program. Of course, you can call, you can ask questions. And if we can't answer it today, of course, we'll do the research and get the answers back to you. And of course, you can also share your brief comments, especially those people who are in recovery. And um, I know that uh, we are being followed on Facebook and the social media. This program will be posted at the end of it on YouTube. So those of you who are very busy with your work and all of that, you can always go back and listen to the program. And I could be reached at 6713040 if you have any questions arising from the program. So Jason, we've been talking about, on the last program, we spoke about the predisposing factors of drug addiction. The, those would be the biological factors, the psychological, the social factors. We looked at the precipitating factors, that is those things that would cause you to start. And I will just quickly touch on some of those before we go into the topic for today. For those who might have missed the program. And then there are the perpetuating factors. All these three factors, the predisposing, precipitating, and perpetuating factors could be found in the biological area, the psychological, or the social area as well. So some of the predisposing biological factors would be your genetics. You know, if you had ancestors on both your father's side or mother's side, who were alcoholics or drug addicts, you could have inherited that predisposition from them. It could also be a predisposing psychological factor would also be if you are growing up in a household where there's the prevalence of drinking or drug use, you would be seeing this and you would be also uh, copying that behavior going forward. And then there are predisposing psychological factors, like people who suffer with poor self-esteem, low self-esteem, poor coping skills and all of that, and who would have started to use it recreationally, but found that they could start using it as a crutch, you know, as something to prop themselves up with. And it could have started off like that. This could have predisposed them. And then there are factors that precipitate you know, some people would have been drinking recreationally and then they had some crisis in their life, you know, like a divorce, a estrangement, separation, or the death of a loved one or spouse. And they start using the alcohol or drugs to help them to cope with that. That incident could be the precipitating factor. And those who would have been biologically predisposed, now they can now actually become compulsive users of the substance. And uh, there could be also, you know, loss of job, foreclosure on a mortgage, these financial difficulties as well. Like we just went through the COVID pandemic, which would have precipitated a lot of people. You know, they, I did the research and, and there was an increased use in, the, in, 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 in alcohol and all of that during the time of the, pan the COVID pandemic, because people were now all locked up away from work, you know, losing income, going through a lot of stress, have, a lot of them lost a lot of loved ones and so on, and would have now switched to using alcohol or drugs to help them to cope with it during that time. But this is how it starts situationally, and then you become habituated to it and you become dependent. And this is what will lead to the perpetuating factors. One is, it is available, you know, in Trinidad, we have alcohol. There's never been a shortage of alcohol. And of course, now we have decriminal, decriminalized the use of marijuana. So that too is available. And uh, notwithstanding the fact that cocaine and all the others are on the illicit list, they are illegal. But we know, Jason, that people still find ways to get it, you know? That's the nature of the, 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 that, that drug culture. You know, in fact, the more it is prohibited, 
that actually sends up the price, you know, for the for the people who are indulged in that business. So the dependence becomes the perpetuating factor. The fact that you can't now, you have become physically dependent of many different sorts. Your people become physically dependent on the drug that in that they don't, if they don't have it, their hands shaking, they can't sign the attendance register in the morning, they can't transact business. And it leads to feeling, then when it, it is more extreme, they can start hallucinating and hearing things that are not there and so on. So you have physical withdrawal symptoms that will push you to continue to use it. And this is what a lot of people don't understand, relatives and colleagues, they can't understand how an intelligent person, you know, who came from such a good family background could now continue to use drugs in spite of seeing the damage and the devastation it is causing in their life. So this is what this program is about. It's about educating our population. And if you go to the, my YouTube channel, all you have to do is type in my name, as you see on the Ramnaris Duarica. And you'll see all the programs that we've done in the last few weeks. And each one of them is so packaged that they can deal with specific issues. There are programs that will relate to how can you determine whether you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. And if you so determine, where can you get help? We also discussed on our previous programs, the methods, the strategies for staying sober. And today, I would really like to look at prescription pill addiction, because we basically are very silent on that, you know, because we believe since it is prescribed by doctors and we buy it in a pharmacy and all of that, you know, we go to these private nursing homes and, and we get these drugs, that it is okay to go ahead and use it. And it is. Unfortunately, in spite of the fact that it is okay to use these drugs, I am seeing more and more people becoming dependent. And I'm not here for a minute blaming the doctors and the medical professionals for this. Because in my over 40 years of practice in this field in social work, I have seen a lot of patients who, you know, they, they're going through a situation. For instance, they, they may have lost a loved one or they would have had some challenges or they, it could also arise from the biological area of their life. You know, some stressor, some accident, some illness, some injury. And they were, who would have started using alcohol, for instance, or even marijuana recreationally, realized that, look, I could use this to help me to cope now. And so because of the stigma associated to drug use, Jason, a lot of people... They, 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 they try every strategy known to them to try to manage and to control their drug use. And, um, you know, nobody, and I went through that myself, no one of us with a drug problem will, you know, just come out like that and admit we have a problem with our drugs. We need help. I see that every day. Actually, it's been labeled as a disease. Alcoholism is a disease. Drug addiction is a, is a disease. But it's a disease of denial, where the person who is suffering with the condition seems to be the last one to admit. Everybody, the friends, family, siblings, parents, everybody would see this person going down that slide into drug addiction, would see the transformation from the time when they were not using drugs to the time now they were they're using drugs. You're seeing the physical signs the psychological signs, you're seeing the social condition, you're seeing them getting into trouble, looking on camp, dropping out from school, not taking care of themselves, becoming very aggressive, you know, rebellious, deviant, all that kind of behavior, you're seeing the transformation. And this is first obvious to parents and siblings because they grow up seeing the, this brother or sister Knowing before they started to use the drugs, how they used to be very responsible, very partic particular and meticulous about their, the way they carry themselves. And now it seems that they are deteriorating progressively. And what is happening, especially those people 
who could everyone who could afford it, the upper middle class, and even those people in the working class, if you could afford it, our first line of intervention is we go to the, our doctors, right? And once you go to the doctor, medicine, generally, we most of us, and even in my time with alcoholism, I would go to get a medical certificate because I would have missed quite a few days of work. And the doctors sometimes, well, of course, one of the symptoms of alcoholism and drug use is dishonesty. We don't ever tell the true story. We go and we will say, well, doc, you know, I have, you know, I have, I'm going through some stress and I'm having trouble to sleep, which is one of the withdrawal symptoms of drug addiction. Insomnia is one of them. Depression is another one. Anxiety. So we go to the doctor and we, we present with these symptoms. And the, the doctor, of course, will prescribe an anti anxiolytic or a sedative or one of those to, for us, you know. And, and the doctors would tell us, you know, that, look, this is only temporary. They'll even warn us that, look, you could get addicted to this. So they don't prescribe for lengthy periods. They may give you just for a few days, you know, like people who are good, had a death in the family and, you know, they, they really out of it, you know, emotionally. And they go and, 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 they, and, and they see the doctor, they get it prescribed. And the dangerous part of this Jason, is, you know, a lot of people have, has, have educated themselves by going on the internet and they check out things and sometimes they have their own little supply and they slip it to the person. And I've seen people who should know better, people in a responsible position, suggesting to younger people, you know, you can take this. I even saw, uh, were present in a situation where a person who is supposed to be uh, being, uh, being a master of ceremonies of a program and some other person is suggesting to them to look, Take the psychotropic drug. It will help you not to be anxious. You know, you'll be calm and you'll be able to perform. And then think about all those households where the adults, the, the mother in the house, in the medicine cabinet is taking the, the sleeping pill because she has become habituated. She might have started it earlier on because of some little difficulty, some little stress and some argument with the spouse, some adaptive challenge and then it becomes a fixture and especially the people in the upper and middle class you know we go to our psychiatrists and at first we we complain you know of getting feeling anxious because the business you know is in a little bit of a trouble challenges and so on with the workers or the wife at home with the errant husband who is probably you know engaging in infidelity and so on. So you go and, and these would produce situations that would cause you to be anxious or depressed or having trouble to sleep and all of those things. And um, they get prescribed the psychotropic drugs, sedatives, stimulants, and not only people who are going through stressors, but there are people generally in the, in the whole milieu of medication who are now taking, they've been because of their the, the pain and the arthritis and the lower back pains and all of those things, they, they've been put on opioids, painkillers. And you can just as well get addicted to these things. And um, so that there's a large population of people out there that I have come to know because I worked at all the hospitals in Trinidad, Jason. I worked at Port of Spain, St. Anne's Hospital, Cora Hospital, San Fernando Hospital, Coover Hospital. And I have seen a lot of patients who have become dependent on chemotherapy, on medications of all sorts, painkillers, even the, the, the paracetamols and the little ones that you buy over the counter that are non-prescription that you can buy. You can get dependent on these, you know. And if you really read the side effects of these simple little paracetamol and all of those things. It can be fatal at, 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 a, at a certain level. Now, let me say up front, I am not a medical doctor, but I have worked in the field as a psychiatric social worker for many years. I've also 
worked in the field of substance abuse and drug addiction at Cowra Hospital. I used to be director at the Piparo Empowerment Center. I worked at Ward 1 in San Fernando at St. Anne's Hospital. So I have been very close to observe these things and to work on the psychiatric team to see what is happening. In, in fact, it is one of the reasons I decided way back in 1992 to introduce to, to introduce the use of acupuncture in treating drug addiction. Because, and we'll maybe in another program we'll speak a little bit about acupuncture, the, 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 the role of acupuncture in the treatment of drug addiction, because basically you can't get addicted to acupuncture. You understand? And we Caribbean people, we don't like needles per se because of our bad experiences we have had with injections and vaccinations and all of that. From small, we are afraid of needles. So that's a good thing in that we don't have so much of a needle introduced drug addiction problem in the Caribbean, but it is happening, you know? So coming back to the prescription pill addiction, you go to your psychiatrist because, you know, you're having some little, having trouble to sleep, or you're having some psychological challenges, the loss of a loved one, or, you know, foreclosure in your business, you can't meet your payment, or you lost your job, or you may go to your general practitioner and be put now on medication for chronic illness, you know, that is causing pain and you have become dependent. And what happens, Jason? The body is like this. The body is always seeking to go to what is called stasis, balance, normalcy, so that whatever we put in our bodies, whether it be illicit or licit, prescription or otherwise, once it is not made in the body, once it is synthetic as well, pills and all of those things, our body immediately moves to neutralize it. Even as it is causing us to feel sleepy, our body is fighting against it. It's the same thing happens when we drink coffee as well. Our body seeks to neutralize it by pre produ producing our own sedatives to neutralize the stimulant effect of the coffee. So the body is always trying to neutralize these things. And in the meantime, in the process of doing that, we develop what is called tolerance. So that you would find if you had a headache and you took one headache pills, at first, if it's the first time, that one headache pill might, might solve the problem for you. But if the headache is because of some stress that you're going through with workers or your life or your relationships and it persists, or if you have a sinus problem is causing the headache, whatever, because of the Sahara does, you'd find after a little while, after a day or two, one pill is not doing it now, you have to take two. You understand? Because your body is developing tolerance. And I have attended some presentation. I have been able to witness some presentations by our people who, the pharmaceutical representatives, and uh, they generally suggest that if five milligrams would do the job, you know, it is best to give, they suggest you give 10 because you don't want to half solve the problem, especially if it is pain. Although five milligrams might, you know, ease the pain up, they, they would suggest you give 10, just to make sure. And I want you to pay attention to this, Jason. The fact is, no doctor, I work with a lot of doctors, I'm related to doctors as well, and I have a lot of friends who are doctors. No doctor I have found in the world know exactly how many milligrams he would have to prescribe for Jason and how many milligrams you'll have to prescribe for Mr. Dwarika. Well, if both of us were to the doctor, you know, we're both going to get the same 10 milligrams. Whether two milligrams could solve my problem because I am probably different to you. And you probably need 15, but he'll give you start you off with 10. And if it doesn't work, then you'll have to call him. And this is why a lot of us, you know, after we see the doctor, we don't stay in touch with the doctor because it's a story on both sides. And doctors are so busy, they, they're not going to take your private phone call, most of them when they're busy in their office. 
You understand? Or you can't catch them after hours. So you, they don't see you and you can't tell them. And this goes for all kinds of medication eh? because the first time you get a medication, even if it is for diabetes or hypertension, you have to go to the doctor frequently until you arrive at the correct dosage for you. What works for you? Because normally they may start you from small amounts and see if you need to take more and take more. But at the same time, by the time you arrive at the correct dosage, what happens is you develop tolerance. So you still have to go down to increase the dose. Yes. I'm not hearing you, Jace. Hear me now? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Yeah, you hear me now? Okay. As we're on the topic of uh, uh, pills, uh, in your, I mean, it's still a post pandemic era, but um, people have become a little paranoid anytime someone's cough or, or sneeze. Um, and I actually know a few people that anytime that happens, or even if they sneeze or cough or they feel a little sniffles, that they run straight to like cold and flu medication. So, are you seeing any trend of anyone being addicted to like cold and flu medication? I mean, it's not prescribed. You can get it over the counter. So that's why I'm asking if it's um if you see that kind of trend happening since we're in the you post right, You are right on point there, this <laughs> because a lot of people are paranoid about this yeah. because of this has been advertised by the World Health Authority, and you know that is basically how the COVID starts with a little sniffle and a sneeze. And, you know, because of the fear inside a lot of people, they want to deal with it right away. And uh, some of these cough medication, the cough syrups, they are laced with sedatives, you know. In fact, when I was at Cora Hospital, I have had people come up there who were addicted to cough syrup. You know, and um, nobody is paying attention to you, but you're buying it, you know over the counter and, and it and it and it tastes really nice it's sweet you know um however a lot of these people transition uh, eventually they transition to alcohol if they get addicted to the cough syrup you know they transition because the alcohol is more potent and produces the result very quickly but you can stay with on these cough syrups for a long time without even being suspect because it's a, a, a medication you have in the cupboard. So yes, I, I, you, I think it stands to reason that you could see an increase in that area. Um, but most of these pe people will present to their regular general practitioners. I don't really see them until they get addicted to a substance. But what I'm seeing here is that a lot of people who have access Jason, to drugs, prescription pills, and generally, one of the, if we reverse the psychology here, when I'm counseling someone to help them to stay away from any drug, whether it be alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, one of the standard um, recommendations to them, suggestions to them is stay away from people, places, and situations. Slippery people, places, and situations. Slippery meaning places where it is available, right? Now, Think about what I'm saying there, where it is available, because availability is the one first reason anybody would use a drug. Because if you if it was not available, you just couldn't use it, even if you had the desire. So this is why you stay away from the drinking situations. You stay away from the block and the friends who are using the marijuana and all of that, if you want to stay drug free. But now let's take that understanding to people who work in the hospitals and in the pharmacies and in the health centers where they have the drugs available. And they know it is available to them. And I worked in all the hospitals and I can tell you, I mean, it is wrong, but I saw it happening where members of staff from the cleaners, they find a way to get a prescription. You know, uh, I, I'm wondering whether I should, you know, they get a file, a patient file, they get the reference number, they get somebody to write a prescription, they go to the pharmacy and they collect the medication for themselves, for their relatives, or for, their for their neighbor and for their nana and, and their compi and everybody getting medicine from the hospital. That's why we always have shortages. Uh, I mean, this is implication. I also saw incidents where people are, are making, helping themselves to even the groceries from the pantry, the staff. 
you understand are the hospitals and I'm I, I, I have no apology for saying this because the authorities need to investigate you know these things but this program is not about that but it happens you know where even the linen finds it way it, it, itself away into people's homes and all of that so coming back to the availability of the drug I have had people who doctors who in their days as medical students learn that look you could take this you know at first they would take a drink to help them to sleep you know when you wake late and you have to sleep because you have a you have to attend class in the morning and it's two three in the morning and you can't sleep because it's way past your normal bedtime so you take a drink and you put yourself to sleep and i mean these people they are in the in the middle of the science of it so they know um, what would work and and so they they eventually they graduate to take a, a, a sleeping pill and so you have a lot of people who in the in the helping professions who work in those areas but not only the people who work in the hospitals the people who could afford it to go to their private psychiatrist and so on they get prescribed these drugs and after a little while they read the label they google it these days and instead of going back to pay the doctor a, a, a consultation fee, they just go to the pharmacy and, 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 and they refill. You understand? They just ask for it. And there's some pharmacies that uh, are not as, as, as um, insistent as they should be on the illegal requirements. And, and as I say this, you know, Jason, I recall even in my own experience, I went to a school in San Fernando, Southern Polytechnic, and uh, on the way from school to the taxi stand, there's this pharmacy on, on Coffee Street that you could just go and walk in in there and buy some of these stimulants. I don't want to call the name to give college people an idea, you know? And, and, and you know, your friends, everybody using it to stay up late and beat the books, as we say not knowing how dangerous these things could have been, you know? And um, I don't know if it is still happening. I, I, it, I, I suspect if it was happening way back in 1964 and 63, 64, when I was in school, it probably still is happening because these well, things- Graduating in um, 2011, so my years in UA I actually saw that, uh, yes, they actually used those pills still to stay up to study. So even well, up to man, Jason, I'm so happy you you share that because it hasn't stopped. You understand? No. And and then in the household, it becomes a culture where people see mommy going and take the pill and daddy taking the pill and everybody taking the pill to sleep. And there's one to sleep and there's one to wake up, the stimulant to wake up. And they want to stay up late in the night. And it becomes a culture and people see nothing wrong with it. You understand? Until... Guess what is happening? I'm seeing a lot of patients in recent times who were put at some time in their teenage years, some in their, you know, 18, 19, put on these psychiatric drugs, anti-anxiolytics for anxiety or for depression or for insomnia, you know. And what happens after a while, they develop tolerance and then they're going to the party and all of that. So they get introduced to alcohol and the other stuff, the marijuana and all of that. And then they become their own chemist. And they are using it now in conjunction. You know, I mean, the body doesn't know whether it was legal or illegal. You know, the body, I mean, our, our, our brain, yes, our eyes could read the label and all of that. But the body, the, the chemistry of our body doesn't really care how how you procure the, the substance, it will respond to it as it is supposed to. So a lot of people I have seen now have been using prescription medication in conjunction with alcohol and marijuana and the other drugs. And eventually they're landing themselves into serious trouble because when they develop these drugs, Jason, they never did the, um, the trial tests were never done in conjunction with other drugs. You know, they, they tried out the, 
the sedatives or the stimulant or whatever the anti-anxiolytics or the antidepressant or the tranquilizers by themselves. But the the consumer here now, the person the, the, the person who has become dependent is now using it together with other pills. And it could cause serious damage. I've seen a lot of people suffering with kidney damage now as a result of taking pills that they shouldn't take in conjunction with their diabetes medication. And they're not seeing, they're consulting with their specialists. And I'm not blaming the doctors here. I have to, anyone, I, I would lay blame at the, the feet of the, the user, the person who is taking it because, and I'm saying it here, that anybody who, anyone who is using a drug, it is your responsibility. Even though the doctor gave it to you or the pharmacy gave it to you, you it is your responsibility to educate yourself on it. Mm -hmm. What is this drug going to do? What are the side effects? What other drugs I should not be using with this? And should not because, you know, I grew up in a countryside east. And I saw my grandmother giving Fenzik and caffeine all to the chicken as well, you know. These old people are in the old days. And, and they say it work. You understand? And they will exchange drugs, you know, they buy medicine and, and, and they give it to everybody else in the village. You know, look, this, I had a headache and this work, here, take this. Or this helped me with this. And then, you know, you're having pain, well, try this. Not even know the name. And this is a dangerous practice where people are still doing it. You know, I remember when I, when I, when I studied in Jamaica, I studied social work. And we would go down and do a clinic down on King Street in Jamaica. And there would be a pharmacist, a boy named Subhash, Zan Bahadur Singh, nice guy. And we also had a doctor, my brother-in-law was a doctor at the time. We would go down there and run a clinic. And, and the people would bring all the medication that they had in their cupboard that they hadn't, you know, they, they finished, they got better. They're not using it. And the pharmacist will go through them and see what was for what and which were expired and discard those and will re-prescribe because you had a lot of poor people there who couldn't afford to buy the medication. And we ran that and I would counsel people at the time. And I got a lot of good practice from helping out in that clinic, you know, so that it is a practice here in Trinidad. That please do not prescribe your medication for anybody else. Although a person may look like they had the same condition, they may be, they are probably allergic to it. They're probably taking other medicines and you don't know the disastrous effect it can have, you know? But coming back to the addiction, I'm seeing where a lot of people now who are on both prescription pills and taking alcohol and other drugs with it to supplement it. And even though they realize it is causing a lot of problems for them, physical problems, psychological problems, social problems, getting drunk, getting hallucinating and all kind of thing. And realizing, look, I need to stop. And they're going to AA meetings and everything and they're really trying. But they can't seem to make it. Because, you see, it's like this. If you are drinking white rum and you're getting drunk, right? and you're drinking red rum, you're still going to get drunk because the active ingredient in it is the alcohol. So too, if you are taking alcohol and you, you go to AA meetings and you stop taking the alcohol, but you're still taking the sleeping pills and all of that, those are, this, those are sedatives and doing the same thing the alcohol is doing. So you will not be able to stay sober because you know, for, for a person who has become addicted, especially those people with the genetic predisposition we talked about in last week's program, once you take one little drink, it starts a chemical reaction in you. So once you take the pill that is a sedative, it will create the craving for the alcohol because the, remember the body can't discriminate whether you're getting the sedating effect from the pill or from the alcohol. You understand? It craves this sedation. And so too with the stimulants and so too with the painkillers. You understand? So that if you want to stay drug-free, you have to really 
be prepared to bite the bullet, as we say, and become willing to give up all the psychotropic drugs. Now, so too with the painkillers, the body develops tolerance. And as I said, if the first day you have the headache, one um, tablet might do the job. But after a little while, one is not doing it. Two is not doing it. Three is not doing it as well. The body has its ability, Jason, to make its own painkillers, you know. Uh, its analgesics and all of that to, to sedate itself. You understand? But when we go and take these painkillers outside, which becomes necessary sometimes because mm -hmm. we might have gotten a serious injury and the pain is so severe that our body can't produce the numbing effect quickly enough that we need to get this extra help. But all right, think for a minute as, I, as we're speaking about this. You get a cut or you get a, 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 a you found your finger or something. Do you know if you didn't even take any medication, if you, with time, progressively, the pain will become less and less and less until it will go away. I had a little injury on one of my fingers. I was practicing to play drum and broke the, the nail. And <clears throat> for the last two, three days, I couldn't touch it. But today, it's almost like brand new and I didn't take any painkillers. I just avoid it getting hurt, you know? And I could have put a, a plaster over it you know, to protect it. And so the body has its ability to produce its own painkillers while it heals the body. But a lot of us, because, boy, we have to go to work. We can't stay home and attend to this and nurse this finger and all of that. So mm -hmm. and because the big pharma has done such a good job with our brains, you know, that we have become dependent on every little situation from the cradle to the grave, we already have kind of been schooled and socialized into believing that we have to take something. So we are taking from pediatric this to geriatric that. You understand? And we have become dependent. Our body has become dependent yeah. so that our pain threshold has increased. You know, and I'm seeing people here who have been on pain medication but actually, if you actually point to them, they're already feeling pain. You don't even have to stick a needle in them. You understand? Because the pain threshold has become so high. You know? Yeah. You're going to ask something, yes. Yeah. Well, as we were talking on this, uh, yes, we're talking about the normal man and woman out there. But um, when you, you're listening to the mixing of drugs, the mixing of pills and alcohol, um, my mind is actually running on how many musicians, actors, actresses we've lost to the, the, uh, the consumption of alcohol and uh, um, painkillers, especially. Jason, you are right on point there because it would seem that some of the most talented people we have in the world are, are people who tend to become, because of their, their vast range of emotions, to capture poetry and lyrics and express themselves, I think they become more vulnerable. Maybe we yeah. should do some research there to using drugs. And because if you are a, a, a high-end performer and you have to be on the road doing these shows and you have and you know, engagements one after the other, like we know all of these popular stars. And as I say this, we know Tina Turner just, you know, yeah. died yesterday, I think. So that a lot of them, they tend to now go on these stimulants. And cocaine became very fashionable in that world. And alcohol to sleep, like I said, you know, when you have a, a very hectic lifestyle, you have to take things now to help you to relax and, you know. And in that world, in the entertainment industry, you remember one of the fuel in the entertainment industry is the alcohol and the drugs and it fits in in that lifestyle and all of those things. So, yes. We have lost so many people to drug use. And a lot of them have been honest enough to come out and actually discuss it and say that they've been in treatment and all of that, mm -hmm. including myself, for instance, you know? Yeah, and, um, and the fact is alcohol is, and drugs is a respect of no one. You understand, once you mess with it, it is going to, Take you, down the pro take you down that road. Now, not everybody who uses drugs 
will become drug addicted, you know these things. And I don't have, I have no problem with people who could take a drink and enjoy it. You understand? This program is not about drying up the world. But as I say that, everyone who became addicted started with that first drink. You understand? A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And you don't know. Now, those people who have a history of alcoholism or drug addiction in their family should be more careful because they know there's a genetic predisposition that you could be an alcoholic. And if you go on using it, in no time, you could become dependent. But there's also, with drug addiction, you could learn it. You could become habituated to it. Your brain could become dependent, even if you are not genetically predisposed. So I'm saying that, you know, I know when we're speaking like this, time flies. But I won't, before this program finished, I want to speak to my colleagues the, in, the, in the medical profession. Every doctor or psych... In fact, psychotropic drugs should generally... The ethics of the profession, as I understand it, suggests that they should be prescribed by people who are qualified to do that. That is, consultants, psychiatrists, they should be the people who, after they take a full history, they are qualified to prescribe psychiatric drugs. But even so, my psychiatric colleagues, they have a responsibility when you're prescribing psychiatric drug that you must educate your patients. That, look, this is, this you can become dependent. This is addictive. And you need to monitor carefully so that the person don't become addicted to the drug. In the meantime, they should be referred for counseling to deal with the psychosocial issues that may have predisposed them to the drug, to, to the, the psychiatric condition. For instance, if they, if they can't sleep because of stress, if they're having difficulty with their finances, if they're having problems with their relationships, whatever, pills can't fix those things. Pills will only give you a, a, a very temporary reprieve. But the real treatment is the counseling and psychotherapy. So our population need to understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, but we like shortcuts. You know, want to feel good, want to feel good right now. And then we go after we get the prescription. We don't go back to the psychiatrist. We go and buy the drugs over the counter or under the counter. And now we plaster ourselves and create a really big problem for ourselves. So I also want to say to our uh, people in the general practices, you know, people with, you know, yes, we give pain, pain medication to relieve the condition, but we need the long-term um, treatment is to educate the, the patient so that they could come off the pain medication. Because some of these pain medication are highly addictive, the opioids. Yeah. You understand? I, I know a, a patient I work with here who would leave Chagones and go to Port of Spain to get a, a certain kind of uh, 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 injection mm -hmm. for pain because he had become addicted to it. He couldn't function because even those, when you try to come off the pain medication, there are withdrawal symptoms. So mm -hmm. I'm saying today that the body can become addicted not only to illegal drugs like like well like like um cocaine and and heroin and all those things because now marijuana is decriminalized and alcohol was always legal so you could get addicted yeah. to those but you what can about also those that are, yeah what about those that are actually would um, pay the price to get uh the pharmacist without a prescription access to medicinal marijuana and cocaine, which is actually extremely strong, but uh, they just want to get uh, access to those. Well, as a person in recovery myself, Jason, I can tell you, and I've worked for the last so many years with uh, alcoholics and drug addicts, more than 40 years now. And um, I can tell you that people who have become addicted will explore every avenue to get their drug of choice, to continue to fill that, that, that void, that, to feed their addiction. And they will come up with, you know, in the, in the drug world, it is called prayers. These cocaine addicts, 
when they tell you a story, man, they could even convince God, I tell you. They become so adept, adept at manipulating that they very easily manipulate the pharmacists and everybody. And anyone who can get the drug. And sometimes if they can't get it themselves, they get other people to get it for them. So that the whole question of medical marijuana has been abused. You understand? It, the, the, a lot of people, listen, there's a whole lot. A lot of people have been using it as a painkiller, as an analgesic, as a narcotic. It is a narcotic. And, and they, they, they really exploit the opportunity where wherever there's medical marijuana, of course, all of them will go and get a prescription and come. If you went, Jason, if you went to your doctor, whoever, I mean, no matter how, how good your doctor is, how, I mean, honest and in person of integrity and all of that, and you told him, look, you had a lot of pain and screaming with pain in your back. He can never tell you don't have pain. He would be, I mean, you can't tell a person that they're not, they, you, there's nothing you could measure the pain threshold in a person. You, you may suspect that they probably fake in it. You understand how many people go to Florida and they said they have chest pains and then they end up on having heart surgery and all of that because they know if they say they have pain, nobody can't doubt them. And a lot of people get these prescriptions for medical marijuana because of fictitious you know, spurious claims, fictitious claims. But there, of course, there's the one or two who are genuine, you know, me in need of it. And um, so the, the pharmacist or the person, now, I, you know, you have to sometimes seriously consider whether these places are operating as a shop, as a business, or as a health facility. The pharmacist is there, yes, to serve the needs of the community, into the medical needs. But it's also a business. And to a large extent, sometimes, you know, you have to also question whether the medical professionals are, I mean, they have to live. They charge a fee. They have to pay the rent for the offices and all of that. So there's the business component to all of these things. And today, drug, the drug business has more income coming out of it than the oil business in the world than even the precious metals business. The drug business is one of the biggest business in the world. And I'm saying the drug business, not only the illicit drug. Now, I'm not only talking about the, the cocaine and the marijuana in some places and so on. I'm talking about drugs generally. Big Pharma is making a lot of money. And um, you just look around and see, you know, so that Again, it comes back to all our brothers and sisters listening out there. It is your responsibility to first check and see. You know, let me say first, if you, if you live the right lifestyle, right? You eat the right kinds of food, you exercise, you rest, you maintain the right attitude to life. Your body has the ability to produce all the medicines that it needs. Yes, I know these days, and you listen, I, I listened to a program on, on, on television this morning where there's so much, you know, genetic modification in the foods that we're eating, the amount of pesticides that are in there now that is causing, you know, medical complications for people and so on that we have to contend with. And in addition to that, if we are going to deliberately think, take things that we know a harmful like alcohol and marijuana and cocaine and add to that equation, then we only have ourselves to blame. And this is why this program is about helping us to educate ourselves so that we make the right choices. Please, today you can start by including healthy habits in your eating habits, your lifestyle. A lot of the illnesses we are seeing, the diabetes, and the hypertension, Jason, these are lifestyle illnesses that could be cured by curing your lifestyle, changing your lifestyle, coming back to your correct body weight, eating your vegetables and your fruits. And we are lucky in Trinidad, man. We can grow 
vegetables and fruits anywhere, anytime, all year round. You understand? So we should have no excuse. And in this world, we all have to become the message we like to see. So I myself, I am trying to live, you know, practice what I preach. And I am happy to share that. I thank God I'm at my correct lifestyle. I don't have to take no medication. Even at my age, I, I, I thank God I'm living healthy and happy and have no problems. And I would be willing to share that with anyone. Listening, of course, those of you who are on social media, you can contact me on social media and I'll be happy to respond to your concerns. But again, we do have a prescription pill epidemic in this country that we haven't been talking about. And I think we all in the helping professions and the population out there need to be focused on this. And please read the labels. Be sure you know what you're putting inside of you. So I want to thank you, Jason, mm -hmm. this morning for this program. And of course, anyone wanting to reach me, they can reach me at 671-3040. That mm -hmm. is 671-3040. Thank you always for always taking the time to do this program, Mr. Dwarka. And this was a very informative one, a very eye-opening one as well, too. So join us next Tuesday, which will be the first episode for the month of June. Until then, sit around.